This is a Singer 78 class machine. This particular model is a 78-1. This machine is from 1918. And it was a complete rescue. It was covered in rust and dirt and all kinds of things. It was probably in a home hobbyist uh, shop where someone was likely doing some upholstery work or some other custom work. Um, I got it for like 20 bucks or so. Uh, and this machine is just really an incredible example of an industrial machine. Um, we often showcase um, domestic sewing machines on this channel. And I thought it would be fun to give you a glimpse into the machines out there that actually do sew leather. Uh, I have, uh, it's a common question. People are looking for heavy duty items. They want to sew tote bags. You want to sew something harder, you know, sort of more complicated. Uh, I actually started out wanting to sew shoes, which uh, takes a bit of power to get through some sort of leather and soling leather and some other things. And oftentimes I'm doing that by hand, but there are places where I do like to be able to create stitches and do some sort of sewing on some difficult materials. And so in my collection, I do have some industrial machines in order to, to you know, be able to manage those tasks. This machine is a walking needle machine. Uh, this itself does not have feed dogs. I'm going to go ahead and pull this away so you can see underneath um, this area where you normally see your feed dog, uh, what pr it usually pulls your, your fabric along. And the best sewing machines that you can use for you know pretty much any project are going to be what they call a compound feed or a triple feed. Um, and those will have feed dogs. Um, they'll have also a walking needle. Um, and they'll also have, you know, the walking foot is what they call this. So this is somewhat of a walking foot, but it's technically um, more of a walking needle. And this machine is from 1918. Uh, this is the industrial version of Singer's uh, walking foot machines of the time. Uh, there were domestic machines. Those were uh, under the Davis brand, and they're called the, the Davis vertical feed machines, and they're really lovely. Uh, they're wonderful machines. The, the mechanism to walk the needle is a little different. It's more of like a, a vibration of the back foot sort of moves back and forth. But in this case, it moves up and down like a regular uh, presser foot, and then the toe moves along with it. I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate it really quickly here. Um, I have it on a short stitch, I think. And so you're going to see the needle come down and pierce the fabric. And you're going to see the front toe. The front toe is going to uh, move with the needle as it pierces the fabric. So there's no way you can possibly bunch up the fabric. Um, and then you're going to see the back presser foot come down, hold the fabric in place as the needle and the front toe move forward, and again, pierce the fabric. Um, this machine um, likely was used for leather work, um, light leather work. You know, they did a lot of things with the 78 class machines. They did not, were not as popular as other industrials that did similar functions. And the sort of needle feed specific Singer machines, um, they're just not as common. So this particular one they're relatively obsolete. The needle sizes that are available to fit these machines as they come from the factory or, you know, are stored um, are limited. And most people who have them have either sort of limited their uses to the machine, the needles that are available. I think there's like two different sizes and they're non sort of leather point needles. Um, this particular machine, um, I was able to retime it to take needles for my patcher. So this is actually timed to sew with a 70, sorry, 29 class needle, which I have plenty because I do work on my patcher quite often. To show you the function of the uh, 31 class bobbin, and this is actually, this might be a class 15 bobbin I have stuck in here. Uh, I wouldn't recommend this at home. <laughs> I probably just put this in here for testing sort of the timing and whatnot. Um, this is a relatively um, heavier weight thread on the bottom, and I have a uh, just a regular garment thread um, garment thread weight on top. Um, and so <laughs> eh, I'm not going to worry about the tension, but I just wanted to give you a sense of sort of how this machine sort of operates. The lower, um, the um, hook itself is an oscillating hook. That means that it goes back and forth and rocks to create the stitch. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring up the bobbin thread. Again, you can see that these are very mismatched, uh, sort of playing with fire here. 
by mismatching my thread. Um, yeah, playing, playing with fire on this one. Um, making sure everything's sort of threaded properly, taking a quick look. Um, I'm using, this is duck. Uh, this is cotton duck. This is fairly heavyweight. I forget what this is. This might be like, oh, I forget what the weight is on this one, but this is actually bags, um, canvas that I'm using for bags. It's relatively stiff and thick, and this is just two layers. Um, you go ahead and see sort of how this sews. Um, I think that the tension is what it is. I'm not going to mess with it at the moment, but when these are really running, whoop, you can see it's catching. Um, when these machines are really running, um, I call it the freight train. It kind of sounds like a chugga, 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 chugga. You kind of hear the, the clanking of the, the bobbin rotation. Let's go ahead and pull this up. Pulls out. You can see stitches. Um, that's on, um, on the back here. When you see machines that have um, a bar across the back like this, um, this is actually for raising the presser foot from the table. You know, see me able to peek -a -boop, peek -a -boop. So if the um, if you're trying to raise, you can see the you're using a knee bar on your industrial table, and that will pull up your presser foot for you. You're going to see this, you know, sort of presser foot lift on <laughs> modern machines, but um, it's actually been on industrial machines for a very long time. The this particular machine itself was um, used likely in a treadle, industrial treadle. Um, it may have been set up with a motor. You'll often see sort of larger hand wheels and sort of larger pulleys on machines that are, you know, originally meant to be on a treadle itself. I keep this in a treadle. It shares the industrial treadle with my thirty one fifteen, which is an industrial um, tailor. They call it the tailor's tailor's machine. And it's actually the same size as that. And to give you some idea of reference for sizes, it's helpful to kind of <laughs> get a sense of how big this machine is. It's a little bit like longer. So if I'm going to pull up, I'm working on a featherweight right now. You can see it, Ooh, baby featherweight. Um, it's got a long harp space, lots of room to do work on. They're wonderful machines if you can pick them up, if you're handy, um, or if you come across sort of older, stronger, you know, machines like this. They typically don't go for as much money as the equivalent, modern equivalent, and they have, you know, simple parts, and lots of them are common enough that people have, um, you can, you know, fix them up and repair them, or pick them up from other shops. I hope this is helpful. I, I again, when people ask you if you need to sew leather on a sewing machine, um, you can. I have, you can, with a proper needle, even do it on a featherweight. I've, I've demonstrated that in the past. But uh, if you are serious about your bag making or other kinds of sewing that requires some serious piercing power and or speed, really these industrials are, are the way to go. Um, I thought you'd enjoy sort of seeing like a, a little bit of a dinosaur <laughs> that not many people have um, seen before and get a sense of sort of the size and capabilities of you know, what an industrial machine brings to the table. Hope you enjoyed. Mm -hmm.